Hello guys, welcome to another episode of Bullish Banter where we discuss financial markets, investment scene and uh, interview with traders who have some experience in the industry which might be of value to you and hopefully you can learn one thing and apply it. Obviously, I'm joined with my co-host after a hunt in the wild. Eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you find the dragon? No, uh, I didn't find one, but yeah. I enjoyed the hunt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's the hunt that uh, excites, eh? yeah. the yeah. adrenaline and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi guys, uh, Rufus Kamau here, yeah. markets analyst at FX Pesa. Uh, happy to be back. Um, sometimes uh, I appreciate the time you stay off the markets. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like therapy. Yeah. But then when you come back, a lot That's happens happened. when you're away. Yeah. yeah. Did you at some point miss just opening MT4 and, and then be like, ah, uh, no, not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot has happened in the last couple of uh, weeks, but uh, I think we'll cover them within the next few minutes. Uh, you came with a guest, a very special guest. Yes. We have a very experienced trader and chartist. Yeah. Uh, Walter Maina. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. Yeah, how have you been? How is the markets to you so far? Uh, I've been off for a while, uh-huh. but definitely as a trader, you, you can never go off the, okay. the markets. Okay. Yeah, I, I keep some tabs, but hopefully by the end of the week or <laughs> next week, yeah. I'll be back for you. Ah, nice. We are speaking, as we record this, listeners, it's on Wednesday, where we're expecting FOMC reports and obviously their deliberations the two-day deliberations to be released later on in the evening. So I know by the time you are listening to this, there must have been some significant whipsaws in the markets, uh, pips appreciation, depreciation, and obviously a different scene. And obviously NFP as well will be out. Eh? I would like to pick it up from right there, um, whereby while you are away, Rufus, yeah. another bank uh, beat the bullet. Yeah, <laughs> on Liberty. I saw that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, what happened to uh, First Republic Bank? Um, I think it's quite a story yeah. uh, that started all the way back from uh, 2020. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think the first trigger moment or the first domino was uh, in 2020 when uh, the Fed removed the 10% uh, reserve requirement on all commercial banks. Mm-hmm. So from then, a lot of commercial banks had a lot of uh, funds and uh, they needed to allocate those funds somewhere. Mm-hmm. So U.S. commercial banks majorly went for bonds. Yeah, uh, They locked uh, positions in long-term bonds and uh, they were holding some most of these bonds to maturity. Yeah. So then the Fed um, promised these banks that uh, interest rates would stay low and uh, inflation was just... Um, Temporary. Oh, what was the word? Yeah. Transitionary. <laughs> Transitory, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, inflation went really high. I think it peaked at 9.1% in June. Yeah. So, the Fed had to obey its mandate of uh, stabilizing prices. So, we saw the fastest rate hike in history in the US from uh, literally 0% to the current level of 5%. And that had a uh, more uh, solid effect on the markets. Mm-hmm. So, some of these banks were not just holding on to bonds. They also invested in uh, commercial real estate. Yeah. Then, from the COVID-19 era, we saw some uh, different fundamental shifts in the workplace. Uh, after COVID, what we are experiencing now is uh, very low occupancy rates in the commercial uh, real estate sector. Since a lot of people are majorly working from home, um, when you look at uh, shopping malls, there was a lot of shifts where people started doing online shopping and uh, the demand for commercial real estate really went down. Okay. So we are seeing a lot of uh, risks mm-hmm. happening in commercial real estate. Yes. And at the same time, bond prices are really low while the yields are very high. Okay. Um, Walter, do you normally invest in equities? Okay. Uh, as for equities, uh, I prefer the indices more than Okay. The, the specific uh, ah, okay. stocks. Uh-huh. So it's actually easier for me yeah. since I'm, I'm 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 only used to the to the majors. Okay. The FX majors. Uh-huh. If I spread too far, maybe to the commodities. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's my area. Yeah. Obviously, um, Rufus has touched a lot, and uh, I think it was on uh, 
uh, episode two or three where we touched uh, significantly on the credit Suisse matter. Yes, but um, uh-huh. I haven't finished on uh, what happened to, yes. to the bank. Uh-huh. So um, for them, um, the, the way you think about bonds, uh, it's basically a contract. Mm-hmm. So you know that governments issue bonds every year, yeah. uh, like frequently. Mm-hmm. So during those periods, the bonds uh, were yielding very uh, low percentage. So it's like uh, you get into a contract. Let's say the interest rate is uh, 5%. So if you have a contract worth, let's say, $100 at 5%, then you know that in a year's time, this contract will give you 105 So you are able to sell this contract in the open market. Uh, let's say if I sell it to you right now, you'd probably buy it for $100 knowing that if you hold on to it, at the end of the year, you'll have 105. Mm -hmm. So if the interest rates are then hiked, let's say to 10%, then nobody would really want to buy that bond at 100 because they'll be making a loss, knowing that they can buy another one that would give them 110. So in that case, the, the price of the older bonds goes lower. So the only way you'd buy that bond from me was, uh, if I sold that to you at 95, knowing that you'll make 10 at the end of the year. So what is the money? Yes, that, that's basically what's happening. Mm-hmm. So with those bonds uh, being held right now, they have what you call unrealized losses. Yeah. So when uh, investors and depositors were looking at the books of the First Republic Bank, they could see the un- unrealized losses. Mm-hmm. And knowing that uh, most of these depositors had bigger amounts than the FDIC um, uh, insured, insured amount of 250K, we'll cover. then they basically withdrew their money knowing that the risks were too high. Yeah. So on the other side, we saw the <coughs> stock collapsing. Mm-hmm. So investors knowing that the bank is uh, basically liquid, they basically short the stock. So while people are withdrawing money, the bank was uh, looking for solutions. So remember when uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, yes. the Fed pro- provided a program called BTFP, mm-hmm. where you can borrow short uh, based on the value of the full maturity of your bond. Okay. So the bank could access uh, that amount of money, but the problem is a majority of the uh, assets held by the bank were in commercial real estate. So in terms of liquidating them in time for all depositors to get their cash would very yes. be hard. Given also, uh, you see, if you have bonds, mm-hmm. you can sell them in the market yeah. in honor d- withdrawals. Yes, but then uh, if you are holding unrealized losses and you sell, uh-huh. then you make a big, big loss. Since you don't want that, then yeah. you basically borrow short yes. uh, from the uh, Fed uh-huh. and then honor withdrawals. Okay, but then if your money is in real estate, the Fed da- doesn't cover for that. Okay, so in this case, the bank could not honor, honor withdrawals, mm-hmm. and uh, it had to be put under receivership immediately. Yeah. And later auctioned very quickly. That's another thing. Yeah. Uh, we are we are experiencing a different bank run uh, as compared to the historic bank run. It's not the same. It's yes. not the same when people used to line up in, in a bank and uh, I want my money. I want my money. Yes. If you if you can uh, if you can try see the structure of the regional banks, how especially the ones which have failed and uh, the ones which are next to fail. Uh, what is happening is like the the structure of their customers is mostly the the comp- the corporates and uh most of the corporates is the like the wealthy individuals mm-hmm. so uh corporates when especially what happens to what happened to S- svb uh when it was triggered on twitter by by Thiel, I guess? Thiel, yeah. Peter Thiel. uh Everybody went, uh, okay, all the corporates wanted to withdraw their funds. So uh, uh, their type of withdrawal this time, it's different uh, by, okay, they will just go on to their, to their laptops and uh, it's just a tap of the button and I want to withdraw my money. Yeah. And like the, the normal, the queuing. Yeah. So you can imagine the huge thousands of dollars uh, yeah. which being withdrawn at the same time. I, think. I remember mm-hmm. on the weekend for SVB collapse, yeah. people basically withdrew $40 billion within one day. Exactly. Yeah. That's insane. And, I, and I, I was reading a report you shared with me earlier, the collapse of uh, uh, First Republic, yeah. where some of the owners or how, how they operated, I think they were sold by Bank of America 
opposed yeah. to the acquisition of 20728 from Merrill Lynch. Merrill I think Lynch. Merrill Lynch acquired them. Yeah. And then uh, uh, Merrill Lynch, when it failed, it was sold to Bank of America. And then Bank of America sold it again. And when their strategy of building up was approaching like three wealthy um, individuals. And these guys, whenever they remove their money, that is almost um, a third of their liquid cash or capital reserve to service their regular withdrawals. Exactly. And I think I've mentioned this regularly. There is a social media risk to this bank yes. run or banking crisis. It is not like a credit issue. It is more of a, I'd say, governance and investment structure of their portfolios. But you see, mm -hmm. if the bank is handling its books really well, yes. there's no risk from social media. Yeah. So the risk is from the bank itself. Okay. They didn't do their math. They, uh -huh. they didn't do their risk management. Yeah. So when interest rates went up, they, they didn't have uh, an alternative. They didn't hedge that risk. Yes. So we can't blame this on the depositors. Okay. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that we are recording on a very interesting day. We are yeah. having Federal Open Market Committee meeting, uh, mm -hmm. the second day of their deliberations. And uh, that in Kenyan time, 9.30 p.m., we will be having uh, their decision, first of all, on the base lending rate. And of course, uh, press briefing 30 minutes later. Um, what do you expect from such meetings? generally regarding the banking crisis we are having, let's say banking crisis 2.0 or rather the continuation of it. Mm, a continuation of the same. Okay. I'm expecting a hike. A hike. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you expect another cut towards the end of the year? Uh, not a cut. Uh -huh. uh, a pause will happen uh, before a cut. Okay. Do you think like the market, this is to you Rufus, like now we are, we are, we are stuck in a position whereby we are looking at, we are, basically prophet, uh, prophesizing, okay, Fed will do this, Fed will do that, and then now I can trade. Market has become mm -hmm. like, Fed is like the best decision maker for how you invest. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> they have become <laughs> the center of attraction yeah. as opposed to being the backbench player to make policy and let yeah. the markets do their thing. Um, the Fed has always been an, been the, like the, the premium indicator. Uh -huh. However, in my experience in the markets, yeah. uh, whenever there is a trend, yes. it kind of changes very quickly. Yes. So uh, since March last year, yeah. we have seen this trend. The Fed goes for a rate hike, mm -hmm. dollar strengthens, uh, equities weaken, and it has been the same same story uh, ever since. Yes. But then uh, I think we are approaching uh, a tipping point yeah. where the Fed is almost reaching its goal. Yes. Um, they said that their terminal rate could go between 5 and 5.5%. Yeah. And at the same time, we are at a flippening moment mm -hmm. where, on one hand, inflation peaked at 9.1% 9 9 has kept going down, and in the last reading, it was 5%. Interest rates were at 0 to 0 0.25%, and in the last meeting, they hiked to 5%. Yeah. So inflation and uh, interest rates are both at 5%. Okay. So we, we are going to see a flippening. Okay. So potentially... This afternoon, we'll be seeing the Fed hiking to 5.25%. Yes. Maybe in the next inflation reading will be lower than 5%. Uh, interesting you mentioned that. Uh, I believe, Walter, you normally do a lot of, uh, I mean, I try to follow some of your ideas you share on Twitter. And recently, you had uh, like a structured uh, chat on gold. Eh? And uh, I think part of, if you have been following gold, at least trade for the last couple of weeks, every time we have had positive ISM numbers, uh, the manufacturing data, it has been pretty much stable. I'd say it is above average and showing the economies are prospering. But gold, definitely gold as the price always goes up, it has been playing between 1970, 2005. 1970, 2005, yesterday is when it reached to around 2018. Uh, as we record, uh, like I said, it's on 3rd of May. With the banking crisis, do you foresee maybe gold going up because of all these other side shows from the banking crisis while ignoring, you know, the cause of the economy? Okay, it's funny how people are ignoring the whatever is happening in the banking crisis. They are not taking... They are not taking the matter as serious as, <laughs> as it should be. Cause yes. Can you imagine we've been in, on, a, on a range... For the longest time possible. Yes. Uh, in the in this crisis, yes, you should expect like gold to be going up, 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 and up. Mm -hmm. But uh, since the the four weeks, if you can if you can watch the PF of, of gold and the commodities, yes, it's only silver which is uh, what is PF? Uh, oh, I'm I'm sorry, PA PA price action. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. the price action of the of the of the of the commodities. Yes, for the last like eight weeks. Mm -hmm. There is no huge change, especially this month. 
prices have been pretty much <laughs> yes but oil but, oil <laughs> okay oil, <Great> okay. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, oil has I'm been not, dumping uh, ever since okay, energy, uh, that big jump energy that's a, a different case but uh, i'm usually on the gold and silver okay so that's why i'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm stating my case yeah. but i know oil oil is quite different it's interesting you mentioned that people are ignoring bank banking crisis yes, would yeah. you think maybe and i have as a financial analyst rufa you normally say this investors are pricing in whatever is happening in the global economy and therefore maybe they are hedging in other sectors like if you notice it was it last week on friday um so oh, by that i mean 28th of april so for listeners so that you for context purposes uh, us started the industrial uh, dow jones, jones industrial was actually up almost 3% to almost 30000 plus level it means that the economy is booming and like i mentioned ism and all these other key indicators of economic performances are showing some resilience uh into the quarter and some of the earnings report we are getting right now are performing better is it that not people are, are not ignoring but they see it as a particular sector of the banking crisis something like that um sometimes i try to differentiate investors and the media ah. <laughs> there's all the media is saying okay. and they, then there's what the investors are doing okay so the investors leave a footprint we see that on the charts uh-huh. so on one hand i would say the current rally in gold up 9% on the year yes i would say that, that investors are already putting uh out of uh, money in gold mm-hmm. which is basically a hedge over the risk that is uh, that is correctively in the markets yes so yes i think investors are hedging their positions uh based on that risk yeah then mm-hmm. the media is selling the story like uh the, it's, it's clickbait no they they want to sell you the story that you would click on mm-hmm. so uh, you'll see like uh, the most recent story uh is the first republic bank uh today i think there is a, a new company that is trending mm-hmm. west, uh, west, yes. alliance. Yeah. Yes, yeah. western alliance yes western alliance yes western alliance yeah those uh, six banks which had a, a net uh, depreciation in actually the stock market was was basically paused i think it was six times Yes. for trading on those particular counters due mm. to almost 10% drop within mm. the yeah. markets open on 2nd of may quite yes. interesting so that's why i said like it's a certain subsect of the banking sector but the big banks if you look at uh, hsbc's performance the uk version the yeah. uk entity yeah. had a significant bump in their revenue and their profit post acquisition of svb uk so the big banks are performing better but the small regional banks which majorly happen to be within their mortgage and the real estate are the ones which are maybe suffering um i think the trend is not a us centric thing yes um if you compare different central banks mm-hmm. you'll see the fed has been the most aggressive one yes uh that is among the top economies so having uh raised rates from 0 to like 5% mm-hmm. um it's very aggressive mm-hmm. so that's why we are seeing the fast cracks happening in the US. Okay. But then the cracks are everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so like uh for the UK, yes. they just uh, recently got their interest rates to 4%. Yes. Uh the eurozone is 3.5. We are expecting a 25 basis points on Thursday. Mm-hmm. So once the rates get to that level, then we begin seeing cracks in other commercial banks okay. within Europe and uh, other economies. Yes. Yeah. I, I think Walter asked me this question and I think I'll pose it back to him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what do you see of the future in this is q1 and uh, not q2, q2 one month done we are the smart middle of the month with a lot of data just coming in this first week of may what do you foresee um in the next two three months or even the year okay for the uh, banking sector given that you you view that people are ignoring a certain crisis which is boiling okay the ignorance part uh, is from the what i what i expected if it's 9% now mm-hmm. on gold yes it could be higher okay with the with the with the crisis uh-huh. if it happened in another year yes. it could be higher mm-hmm. so uh what i'm seeing in the recent future which is coming uh everything is pegged on today uh-huh. the fomc yes if we have a a hike uh-huh. definitely we'll see more banks failing okay uh, the regional banks wow. and uh, and definitely uh the fx majors if yeah. we have a hike 
we expect the DXY to, 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 to gain. Okay. And hopefully yes. break out of this range. <laughs> <laughs> that is for DXY or the commodities you trade? The, the DXY, okay. Uh-huh. For the commodities, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, if if definitely we, we have a hike. Okay. And uh, the commodities will be, okay, I, I expect them to fall a little. Okay. Since the, the dollar is, uh, is strong. Is strong, right? okay. So, uh, and the bound, okay, uh, they will strengthen mm-hmm. depending on how the banks will perform. Let me pick your brain a little bit here. I see you normally do a, a good correlation between DXY, which is the dollar index, for those who are not familiar, with the commodities and other asset classes. Mm-hmm. What informs and what parameters do you normally use to give you okay, an idea? If I'm going to trade gold, this is my target for the day. This is where I will end up perhaps this position. What informs your setup, basically? Okay. Uh, according to my, my strategy, Okay. Uh, for the day, okay, it can happen in any in any time frame. in any time frame yes lower higher mm-hmm. but uh I'm more, i concentrate a lot on the on the chart patterns okay so my targets are based on the the, the chart. i'm given targets by the, by my pattern okay from inside the setup uh-huh. i get my targets uh-huh. uh, rufus can understand what i mean i think he has been studying my chart yes also. now you but, can explain to <laughs> me for instance, uh-huh. uh, let's take a triangle. Yes. And a triangle, we have a low and a high. Uh-huh. Yeah. Work with me. A low and a high, A, uh-huh. B, uh-huh. and then a C, okay. and then a D. Uh-huh. And then it comes to breakout. Okay. So between the A, the between the A, the B, yes. we have the, the dike. Let's okay. say like the dike before you get to, to uh-huh. C. Yes. So from B mm-hmm. to the 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 counter trend line yes that's where i get my 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 target so, so that's my estimate my so opportunity what is basically saying yes uh, let's say you're trading a stock uh-huh. and then it makes an initial move let's say from ten dollars to twenty dollars mm-hmm. and then it stays there in between uh-huh. for like a week or so mm-hmm. before breaking out then the basis for the next breakout will be between that ten and twenty dollars okay yeah that range uh kind of predicts what will happen on the break. Okay, that is one question uh, yeah. partly answered. <coughs> the other one now, eh? you want to relate between the dollar index mm-hmm. and commodities or even uh, uh, Euro USD. So what hap- what happens to DXY that tells you this is what to expect, on, let's say Euro USD or even gold? Okay. Uh, and the time frame maybe you prefer to use so that at least... Uh, it, it gives you an idea. Okay, one, I'm a swing trader. Uh-huh. So I use higher time frames. Okay. From four to, to, to daily. Okay. And uh, I consider the weekly a little bit. Yes. But uh, when it comes to the correlation, uh-huh. uh, when DXY goes up, yes, we, we definitely expect uh, the, the dollar to go up, uh, to, uh, to, to strengthen on the USD. Uh-huh. So it, it will be falling. Okay. That's the, that's what you expect. Yes. On, other cross pairs as well. Yes. So that's the correlation, uh-huh. but it is it doesn't happen always. Always, uh, yeah. because I I wanted yeah. to chip in on sometimes gold, especially especially yeah. gold. Uh, yes. <coughs> okay. Uh, gold, especially the the correlation is better mm-hmm. done with majors. Oh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. With so, the effects is with the effects is very accurate, mm-hmm. a, a little bit accurate. Yes. Yeah. But on on commodities, uh-huh. that's why. Uh, it was difficult to answer the question when you related the DXY with gold. Yes. And uh, gold, it is moved a lot by some fundamentals uh-huh. on how things are. Okay. Uh, unlike the strength of gold. Yes. Uh, 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 the strength of DXY. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I think the way the way I see it uh-huh. is uh, you find one thing that is uh, predictable. Yes. And then use that to measure something else. Uh-huh. You see, the, like the way we measure time. Yes. You look at the, how our planet takes mm-hmm. to go around the sun, mm-hmm. and then you compare that with how long your maze will take to mature. Yes. So it's kind of similar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when you look at the dollar index, yeah. uh, it's basically a measurement of the dollar strength in comparison with six other currencies. Okay. So it gives you an average uh, measure of how strong the dollar is. Okay. And once you get that, uh-huh. now you can compare with another currency yeah. and see, uh, predict the change. For instance, if the, do- the dollar is really strong, 
then you can uh, do the fundamentals on another currency yes. and learn how to trade. Okay. If the dollar is strong, you obviously you want to trade with the weaker currency. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I think we, we have significantly covered FOMC and I think maybe in some Twitter spaces or some other uh, arena, we can address now post FOMC and uh, maybe give an update on that. Eh? Bank of Japan, they did something interesting. I think it was on Friday, right? Yeah. Yeah, Friday, that would be 28th of April, whereby uh, they basically delayed the entire uh, release of their deliberations for like, I think it was almost two hours. It came up at around 8.30 a.m. in the morning. And they are saying that they are looking to change how they view the economy. And uh, in, in line with what we see in the future, do you maybe see them doing a, uh, scrapping away the lower interest rate in the future. I don't know who wants to go first on that. <laughs> uh, BUJ is trapped. The yeah. Bank of Japan is trapped. Uh-huh. Um, when I look at the Bank of Japan yes. and uh, their policy over the last two decades, um, they have really maintained low interest rates. Uh, I think from 20, 2014, they have been doing negative 0.1 negatives. interest rates. Yeah. So main reason they have been doing this is because they've been issuing too much debt. So if the interest rates were to rise in the economy, mm-hmm. then there would be a bigger load on the Bank of Japan. So if they eventually start hiking interest rates, then that would uh, make sure they have more interest payments to make. Okay. Yeah. So I don't foresee a period where they will be hiking uh, interest rates. So they, it means that BOJ, or rather in the market now for any trader, yeah. JPY, will it continue to weaken? Or, uh, because definitely, I, definitely. There was a move, I think it was sometime last year, hit a peak high, JJ around 153 there about, and then it has basically dropped. And then right now, I think last week it was really rallying. And, uh, and, and I think where it is at now, and the based on what the sentiments we are getting from uh, the new BOJ governor, they are it seems like they will like there was an allegation of leakage of some of their deliberations to i think it was nikkei mm-hmm. and uh, and it definitely hit uh, some um, um, uh, investors in in unexpected yeah now besides the banking crisis of all those um, um, uh, bank runs um, uh, let's say uh, portfolio which are have a lot of unrealized re- uh, losses I think we have covered this before, but I'd like to also bring it in because it plays al- along within what is happening in the markets. This idea that people want to dump the dollar and other story and other uh, economies wishing to join the BRICS, mm-hmm. eh? does it also pose a challenge to what the Fed is trying to do to sort of contain this banking crisis, at least in the US? Okay. One, I don't think it will be... Okay, it is it is putting a, a little pressure on the dollar, uh-huh. but it, they won't make it. Okay, it is impossible to do that. <laughs> and if they have to do that, they hey, they'll seek for, uh, they, they they really they really have a, way, a long way to go. <laughs> the the structural aspect of it, yeah, exactly. You don't feel like um, every time they announce the intention, mm. they will be spoiling or even uh, causing some volatility, at least for DXY particularly. Okay, uh, that's what I call a ripple. It will just be a ripple in the market. Uh-huh. It will it will be expected, uh-huh. uh, but it will it, it won't hold. Yeah. Uh, for me, what I see is uh, early cracks, uh-huh. and these cracks are getting bigger by the day. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, from what happened on Monday, yes. Basically, one of the biggest banks in the US, actually the biggest bank is JP Morgan Chase, mm-hmm. snapping up a smaller regional bank out of a crisis, uh, and then benefiting from it. Uh, was really a testament of uh, what you have been talking about, whereby the banks have been uh, privatizing gains Mm -hmm. and then socializing losses. Uh, So uh, the cracks are getting wider by the moment. So the fact that the Fed was uh, considering uh, offering a bailout to First Republic Bank based on the value of their commercial real estate, mm-hmm. uh, that's another big crack. Okay. You see, like uh, they, they made an investment decision. Mm-hmm. It didn't play out. Mm-hmm. And then the Fed is coming in to save them. Okay. But then the Fed doesn't have its own money. It's yeah. basically creating more debt. Okay. So when you see these kinds of these things happening, uh-huh. here is uh, what I project playing out. 
uh, we will be seeing potentially uh -huh. more regional banks failing okay. and people moving their money mostly to money market funds because yeah. they are paying better yeah. and eventually back to the big banks. Okay. So if this kind of trend happens mm. and the Fed keeps hiking interest rates as it's doing, mm. then there will be less credit being provided within the economy yeah. because the banks are currently more sensitive because they are holding unrealized losses. So uh -huh. that would potentially lead to a recession. Yeah. And in order to avoid the US economy going into an actual depression, yes. the Fed will have to open the floodgates again. So you said you said they are privatizing um, gains, profit, gains yes. and then socializing yes. losses. Yes, definitely. Isn't that, isn't that familiar? <laughs> Too big to fail. No. You, <laughs> wait, wait, you are not ready for where I'm going. Eh? Ah. You know, Chelsea. <laughs> you're right Chelsea basically privatized gains socialized losses every day five days in, a, in, a, in like I think five March days proper losses everyone is you know actually six yeah see socialized losses yeah? that is a bearish that is a bearish bearish moment anyway yeah. Yeah. back to oil eh? yeah this month I think began on uh, 1st of May yeah um they began the cuts on on oil, eh? yeah. and we have seen a depreciating price of oil. Um, I don't know what is happening to basically the price of oil because it, if I if I saw correctly, the number of PMI from China purchasing managers index is quite uh, it just dropped by around 0.1 percent, right? Yes, and uh, generally ISM has been fairly above 48, 49, some even above 50. What is happening to the price of oil? Is there no demand? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's crazy. Like uh, for the last couple of uh, years, yes. every time the OPEC has announced an oil output cut, mm -hmm. the natural expectation is that the market will rally, yes. but it often drops. Okay. Yeah. Like every month after announcement, we normally see a price drop. However, if you look at the fundamentals, uh -huh. uh, that is uh, the supply and demand for oil, yes. uh, I think there's a uh, an actual global slowdown. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen uh, the US economy GDP was read at 0 0.1. Yeah, 0 0.1. Yeah. Actually, yeah. So down. with yeah. this kind of slowdown, yeah. it basically means that there is less demand for oil, uh -huh. which basically means lower prices. And also US, yeah, their reserve also increased. I think the, the number we got last week, it increased yeah. from 2.5, uh, around 500 million barrels yes. in terms of storage. I, I, I don't think they build uh, higher production capacity. Uh, so it's more or less lower demand okay. leading to increased reserves. Now to the big R word. Do you foresee a recession? Let's say Q3, Q4, or even next year, Q1, 2023. Uh, right now it's unavoidable uh -huh. in my books. Okay. Uh, in your books, what are yes. the key indicators of recession is coming? Because in mine, I think okay, it's the inverted uh, yield curve and, uh, and you know, um, unemployment going up to about okay. 4%. Uh, from 2008, uh -huh. we, can, we can pick a few moments. Yes. Like what we are experiencing right now with the, with the regional banks. Yes. Uh, could we quit it with, the, with what happened with Bear Stones? Yes. And uh, from there, I think... If we continue increasing, uh, uh, when the interest rates continue going up, we expect more banks to follow the same suit. And okay. One of the major, one of the big banks will be, will be caught in the crossfires, and uh, it will just, it will be the tipping point. Now that will be the, let's say, the beginning of the contagion. Exactly. As a trader, I know you have been in. How many years by there have you been trading? Um, I started off in 2017. 2017. Yeah. What made you stick? What made me stay? Yeah. Uh, I'm doing finance. I'm okay. a finance student. So, okay. Uh, the love of the markets. Okay. <laughs> I, I just love the, the numbers. And, and uh, my mind is very... Uh, okay. You're always on your toes. Always on my toes. Patterns, patterns, patterns. Yeah. That's how my mind works. <laughs> patterns, patterns, patterns. Maybe what is the biggest lesson maybe you have gotten from the market and maybe what would be the best advice you'll give to a trader? is beginning his journey okay uh what i'd say uh trading is more about knowing yourself mm -hmm. and uh after knowing yourself you know after knowing yourself you know what to risk you know how to react to your to your emotions and uh, from there on you can you can know how to tame yourself yeah and uh, be disciplined in how you handle the markets okay so 
it 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 boils down to discipline yeah. but not that the most profitable traders are are always disciplined but what they know they know when the emotion the emotions occur okay. so uh in everything it's boils down to discipline 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 in terms of of course your your learning curve uh, what tools did you say okay now these are basically what i need what did you come to a conclusion that this is what probably you'd want to apply as a trader some of the things that which actually formed your discipline and obviously your strategy okay uh for my strategy mm-hmm. it was funny how i went around it uh the first book i read uh, it was called naked trade okay uh it was about harmonics mm-hmm. uh with an when uh, towards the end of the book they were introducing the classicals yeah where the harmonics were borrowed from uh-huh. from the from the earlier days of the do for the do days uh-huh. the 1930s and years so uh like a normal trader you you since i'm, I'm self taught <laughs> good from one strategy to another i went to indicators and uh-huh. after roaming all over the internet uh-huh. i went back to my hard copy book of naked trade towards the end uh, the, the the introduction to the classical the, the classical charting and everything yeah. so i had to go back to the ch- classic chart to what you call the charting bible okay <laughs> Is the charting that, bible uh, is going, a, going back to your first wife. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you go back to your first wife. You go back fun? to the basics. Isn't that funny Robert, because yeah. for me and I think many <coughs> traders may relate to this. Uh, yeah. You find yourself wanting to learn so many things. Exactly. Yeah. And then somebody just tells you just clear that chart. Let me see the candlesticks. Yeah. And then everything becomes I would say much easier yeah. or much more understandable yeah. now yeah, that's clear right. yeah. yeah and 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 maybe do in terms of indicators i know any trader i normally say whatever is making you money and you find yourself comfortable with the strategy yeah. it is right uh, because i have no right to lecture what is actually your bread and butter right <laughs> <laughs> you know the other day uh-huh. <clears throat> we were having a conversation with Walter yeah uh it was about a very popular trading system uh being advertised out there called ICT concepts yeah but then when you take a deeper dive and you look at it uh-huh. it boils back to the same old concepts yes. of support and resistance yeah. my, my yeah. thought is that okay. yeah. uh-huh. I mean what i say uh you have to identify the chart to appreciate the simplicity of the chart so you have to go you you have to apply the indicators you get confused 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 uh-huh. so that you can appreciate the simplicity of it okay so it is a learning phase uh-huh. which is very important yes. and uh, i'm glad i did learn about the, the indicators although they are lagging uh-huh. they look some few and I, <laughs> I, I, it expanded your knowledge at least exactly but at uh-huh. the end of the day you uh-huh. what i don't like doing is uh, crowding my mind uh-huh. with everything in the markets you cannot master the markets so uh-huh. you just need to uh-huh. capitalize on what you know and then you try it what is your view basically of the fx market in kenya is it from the trader side and over the retail How, when you interact with fellow traders maybe from an outsider perspective as opposed to myself what is the scene like in the economy and your friend how is it we have a long way to go mm-hmm. uh first the education uh-huh. education wise uh we still have the effects is a scam effects is a scam okay. and, and everything yeah and uh sometimes you are not even proud to be called, to, to be called a trader okay <laughs> so we need to we need to make very many people and learn the what the 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 black hats of our industry did okay and uh for us to do that uh we need to to find a very good way of a, a very objective way of making the education the education being become simpler okay. and uh, reach out to people okay <laughs> a quick one yeah. <laughs> what does your family think you do <laughs> actually we we i have a very understanding family uh, are they from within the finance not really uh, actually they are just uh, business family. okay Yeah, I'm raised in a business family. Uh-huh. So uh what what they Okay, the patience they they, they uh, when I started they appreciated it and everything uh-huh. but the patience to to continue doing the same thing without re, without the results at first. Okay. It was a 
it was a struggle uh -huh. but right now they appreciate okay because they they understand even more yes they they some even say they they are in another world they could be traders like me <laughs> but uh, the, the patient side is quite uh, okay wanted. the patient side but mm -hmm. we even need not only the traders everybody we need to 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 make these people understand what we do in the industry okay with the, Yeah, my, my family thinks I do some stuff online. <laughs> <laughs> They don't know. <laughs> well, well, it's you know, sometimes it's hard to explain. Of right. course, what is leverage? Yeah. Yeah. You see, <laughs> some of these words. Uh, Where does your money come from? Exactly. So, so, so those very small, small words within the effects industry definitely um, confuses a lot of people. I, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Walter. Alias Wamiteko <laughs> on Twitter for gracing us with the occasion. I think you have shared some aspects of it, and uh, it's something that I will pick on and continue the conversation online as well. Any closing remarks, Rufus? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Walter. Mm. Uh, thank you for joining us. It was uh, really an honor mm. having you on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we'll do one more. Yeah. yeah. And, and perhaps a couple of more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank our audience mm -hmm. uh, for your support, uh, for sharing the podcast, and also for turning up for each and every episode. I always share your questions, guys, by the way. Closing remarks. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, it was my first time, a very jittery time. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, definitely, I've learned a lot. Okay. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Let's see what forms he has for us this evening. Mm -hmm. Other than that, guys, adios. Adios.